Welcome to this week's episode of The Woodshed, a podcast made by jazz ship posters for jazz musicians. Today we'll be discussing discussing several genres of jazz and how much we hate them or like them. Uh, before I introduce our guests, I'd like to give some love to the people who have supported us so far. Uh, the vid- beautiful intro you'll hear is by uh, Leroy Trolley. The outro is by Sam Watson. And the artwork is by Daniel Gandelman. All right, so as you know, I'll be your host, Andy Brent. Um, I'm an all right trumpet player. I play some bass on the side. Uh, I mean, that's that's you, uh, most of you know me. It's pretty fun. Uh, Sam, why don't you do your intro? Yes, I am Sam Watson. Uh, I made the outro, and uh, that's really my main claim to fame. But I also play the saxophone. And uh, I listen to a lot of free jazz music. A lot. All right, I'm Matt Hook. I'm a writer and radio host. I also play a little bit of guitar and bass. And I'm a big fan of free jazz. All right, Sky. (laughs) 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 I'm sorry. Okay. Um, I'm a confirmed jazzaholic. And. I played the saxophone once. It was a dark period in my life, but I am mainly a pianist. Uh, hey, I'm Rago Rao. Uh, I got into jazz like a year ago, and I don't really play. Um, just a little piano. Uh, the first song I learned how to play was Take 5, so there's that, if that speaks to my ability. Uh... <laughs> I know everyone's pretending to sigh because it seems like it's depressing, but everyone's really sighing because it was personally relatable. I've actually never um, played Take Five. That's a fun fact. Uh, I I I play it very strangely. I just fucking uh, scoop one of the notes so hard that it it just sounds disgusting. But I love it. Which one? Uh, let's see. What is it? It's like. That's like how it goes. <laughs> I like that. It really sounds like yeah. It's really good. I like it. Um. It's hard to do fast though. Anyway, let's let's get to the topic at hand. As we've been progressing through our modern society, our modern music, uh, jazz has been expanding into a bunch of different genres because everyone wants to seem different, and they're trying to revive jazz to the, you know, the public. Um, we got we got the fucking jazz rap, new jazz, neo soul. We got all that good stuff, but um. When, when does the jazz stop? Uh, because, you know, a lot of people are just sampling jazz nowadays for their fucking Gucci gang rap covers. Uh, don't, what, don't what are talk, you guys, don't talk what do you guys shit on think? Gucci when, gang, okay? First of all, Gucci hey, gang is off. a good song. Good, it's a fucking good song. It's a banger. Okay? Um, second of all, I have, I kind of hold the, the controversial belief that I don't know, since since we consider something like vocal jazz, jazz music, I've always kind of considered jazz rap also within the genre of jazz. Even if it is sampled. Um, because I feel like sampling has, has kind of takes from the jazz tradition, if I can get really, like, pretentious here. Are people clapping? Are you applauding me? Is someone just tapping on their microphone? <laughs> I don't know what that is. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> well, thank you. The, you can hear Stop. the thunderous applause for my hot take there. But um, it's it's Skyler. It's Sky. Yeah, I agree with Sam on that one. Because something like Guru's Jazzmatazz album. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's an I think amazing. That, album. You can consider that jazz, but I think jazz stops in hip hop when it's like lo-fi, chill, study music, twenty-four hour hip hop playlist. Right, when right, it's like the same hey, four hey, bars. Hey, 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 don't, don't shit talk that. I need that to study. 
I need Gucci Gang. You were just talking that. Right, I mean, it's decent music, but I, would, I don't know if I'd call it jazz. Because it needs that improvisation right. element to it to really be jazz. And, like, a rapper rapping over jazz songs is still improvisatory. How do you say improvisatory? So. Improvisatory. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> Good word. I, don't, I don't think that, like, specific improvisation, like, taking a solo or like anything like that is required for it to be jazz. I mean, if you look at stuff that Charles Mingus made like late in his career, he was making these like super orchestrated, like almost like third stream classical stuff that like was pretty light on the improvisation. And I mean, that was still definitely considered jazz. I think, I don't think that's a very controversial stance. So I don't think the improvisation is, I mean, it's a big part of jazz history, but I don't think that it's important. Well, it's important, but I don't think that it's a key aspect of what makes something be called jazz in the first place. I think there are other factors that go into it. You know, everybody always says, like, jazz yeah. idioms, whatever the fuck that means. But, um, yeah. But I feel like that's partially just because I mean, Mingus is... is a jazz musician. So, like, people didn't want to call his stuff third wave classical. They're like, oh, he's jazz music. So he's a jazz musician, so he has to make jazz. Right, did you guys watch that, uh, the one Bill Evans video where he's talking about the uh, improvising or whatever, um, and he says jazz is where one minute's music is written in one minute's time, so basically, like, live, pretty much, um, where it's, like, it could be, like, a pre-composed, like, melody or, like, a chord pattern or, like, you know, an arrangement, but he's still playing that recording in, you know, live, so, um, I really like that definition just because it's, like, really clear-cut. I mean, yeah, this starts getting into what is jazz. I like to think of jazz as having uh, improv. I mean, that's like the sole thing for me. And it, it has to ha at least have improv. Some people disagree with me. Um, you know, they'll say you know, like a whole arranged thing. A lot of like, uh, not smooth jazz, but like smooth jazz-esque pieces that are just uh, a rhythm section just going through changes and not really improving, they'll say that's jazz. It makes me uncomfortable. I right. think at least that that is really shit jazz. I mean, that's but when you I have, like, the you. really hot take, like, journalists that say, like, oh, Miles Davis doesn't play jazz because, you know, improv existed before Miles Davis, and then there's other people that are like, oh, the first true jazz was, like, Bach, and you're like, what? Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah I've, no. I've heard that hot take where people are like, Bach is the real jazz. <laughs> I'm like, no, I mean, no, no, okay, so no. to bring in an example here, right, so... Go back to pretentious, people... elitist, classical fuckers, whatever <laughs> that page is called. Um, so p you, people know that I like uh, uh, Yusef Kamal's album from 2016, Black Focus, right? That yes. album is, is pretty minimal on, like, solos and improvisation. It's, it's a lot of, like, extended jams, basically, over, I don't know, kind of a simple chord progression and... It just kind of slowly evolves, and there is improvisation in there, but kind of what I was getting at is that that improvisation doesn't have to take the form of kind of an extended focus on a soloist, you know? And it, like, kind of like how bebop and hardbop were. It was very much like about the virtuosity of the one person improv improving on the, on the chords or whatever. But like in this album and albums like it and things like that, you hear little, little interplay between the keyboardist and the bassist and small little improvisatory things and that fills my quota of improv and jazz you know right. i don't no, need to hear that's, that's definitely like i remember saving the song when you like mentioned it somewhere um and I, I agree that like improv doesn't have to be like a long like four chorus solo it could just be like it, it, those little interplays would still count as improv because they're not really like written in the sheet quote unquote mm-hmm so even things that build up just like a jam where like a two chord vamp for 40 minutes where there's like little trade off like that would still be improv because Did the you next mean time they do Miles it, Davis's live fusion albums <laughs> pretty much yeah <laughs> Oh gosh I hate him I hate them all <laughs> Oh my god I I love Miles fusion albums those are my favorite stuff from Miles yeah, we should make, like, really a, a bonus oh my, podcast. You are trash, like, my friend. Of, <laughs> total trash. Speaking of hip-hop, have you heard of Miles' Davis album with Easy Moby, where it's basically just the, him playing trumpet over hip-hop beats? 
I haven't actually. Wasn't I haven't that really heard any like album? really late milestone. It was like yeah, it was his last album before he died. What was it called? The Doo Wop album? Yeah, like it's that? like Doo Wop. <laughs> Doo Bop. Like, the guy who produced it later went on to produce like most of Biggie Smalls. That's pretty sick. I'm gonna Sounds look like, that up. Sounds uh, like Blue Mitchell and no, not Chet Baker. Chet Baker just went to Fusion, but uh, Blue Mitchell did uh, the same thing towards the end of his career, and uh, Lester Bowie also had Biggie on and did some cool shit. I really liked that. Um, Sky has died, unfortunately. But oh, no. we're gonna carry on. Um, somebody, we'll get somebody. To when does that. the jazz stop? It's <laughs> hopefully soon. Hopefully soon, because <laughs> <laughs> the the reign yeah. of terror has gone on for far too long. Yeah, it's just <laughs> someone wanted to talk about <laughs> us to talk about how jazz makes us depressed. And I think it's very important <laughs> that we we all band together um, to fight depression by ending jazz forever. It's yeah. it is the one of the major causes of depression in the United States. So what do you guys does think listening to jazz? Soul? Mm -hmm. uh, before that, I was asking. Okay, let me tell you, boy. <laughs> let me tell you. So I, <laughs> I have been to prepare for this fucking podcast because I don't all of these genres. I'm not a big fan of. So I was listening to Neo Soul last night. I was listening to Rob Arugula or whatever the fuck his name Araha. is. Uh, <laughs> uh, Moon Moonchild. Uh, not to be confused with uh, Sun Ra. They're not related, um, obviously, because the quality and difference in their work is very intense. Sun Ra is actually good. Moonchild is, eh. uh, who else did I listen to? Some other uh, anomaly. Yeah. So here's how. Here's what I feel. Here's how I feel. <laughs> here we go. Here um, we go. <laughs> here, here's the take. Here's the. So I felt that it should always be raining. <laughs> when I listen to Neo Soul. And apparently a lot of artists understand this and just put a rain backing track in uh, their uh, <laughs> song. I also get a very strong vaporwave vibe. I feel like you're uh, just, just listening it feels, to like, not... <laughs> I, I listened what you guys told me to listen to. Fuck off, this is your fault. <laughs> I, I should anyway. Said, Cause like, I don't, when I think of Neo Soul, I think of more like Erica Badu or D'Angelo. Or like Max. Why did you send me them then? I this didn't is see the thread. So you set me up. You set me up. I did not see that thread where people oh, recommended you those Neo no, Soul artists. I, it's like I keep expecting. I'm like, when's the rap gonna come in? When's the rap gonna come in? And it never comes because because it just feels incomplete. Every single song sounds the exact same. It's in the same tempo, which I mean, I guess is the point of the genre. I can't hate it for that. But it sounds like I got a bad fucking, uh, do like a weak ass dose of acid jazz. You know, it's, I got a, it's just a shitty dealer and it's just less groove. And I also feel like it's an evolution of cool jazz in the wrong direction. I just hear these fucking drum machine loops for the whole entire song. And I just, it's not enough for me. Uh, when's the rap come in? When when do I hear Gucci Gang, 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 Gucci Gang? Okay, so you know what it is. I feel like it's the kind of jazz music that goes in the Spotify pre-generated playlists of like jazz today. You know, it's like yes, that stuff that they like license from from like stock music corporation. That's what it sounds like to me. It sounds kind of like stock music, but like it's like it's like one step above stock music. I haven't listened to any of the neo soul artists you've mentioned. So I can't really say, but like. Oh, well, thank you for your contribution. <laughs> so, so, so I have listened to other neo soul artists, but I, but like like the ones I mentioned myself, and like I feel like they're less elevator e than what like it sounds like Moonchild and Arugula are. Yeah, real Arugula. But like I will I would say, like consider... I will say, I did in. I would like consider though like Esmeralda Spalding's last album, like Emily D and the Evolution Revolution. I would consider that like Neo Soul though. I I when I was listening to Moonchild, I did enjoy it, 
it's just the entire album sounded the same. Like, it's just like there wasn't much diversity in it. And it's like, it really feels like background music, like at a coffee shop or something. It's not music I would really listen to without doing something that uses my mind. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Like it would be in the background of this podcast. That's that's how like low key it is. And I will say the real Arugula, he does play. <laughs> he I I do enjoy his soloing, but it's still the re- everything else is just so boring and repetitive, and it's I can't I can't get into it. Can't dig it. Can you dig it? Can you dig it? I actually can. <laughs> so thank you for that, Andy. I appreciated I'd that say, rant. I feel like the Neo Soul has more variation, though, than that. But, like, I should have listened to those artists like Moonchild and them, but I feel like that's more of the elevator aspects of Neo Soul, which it does have, but, like, there's more to the genre. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to, like, write off the genre at all. Um, But just what I've heard from it has been bad <laughs> to, just, to, there's no other way to put it for me like d'angelo's voodoo album that's where i'd start because it just has the perfect mix of everything and like there's a method man feature on it like method man and red man are on the tracks and they do really well and there's a good variation i know charlie hunter's on it as far as like beat structure but it still has that kind of very long jammed out portions which are very fun D'Angelo, and D'Angelo actually has, like, a personality as a vocalist, which is, like, important. (laughs) Yeah. No, that's definitely true. Um, You know, the vocalist, that was the one thing I actually kind of liked about Hiatus Coyote when I listened to them. Their vocalist, um, she's, I think she's pretty good, but uh, their their instrumentals are not, not very interesting. When I was in high school, um... There were people who there were people in my jazz combo who wanted us to play a hiatus hiatus coyote tune, and it was like I think it's one of the more popular ones. And they were like, it's like they were like, it's so interesting. Look at this. They switch to a bar of five four right in the middle of the song, and then they go back to four four. And I was like, that like that's it. That's what you have to offer me. It it goes to five four in the middle, and then they wanted me to play the vocal line as a saxophonist, and I was like, that it's just not going to work out. You know, it's like it's it's sold me. <laughs> Sam, <laughs> hiatus are such like critical darlings, though. Well, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. Well, hello. It would seem the woodshed is experiencing some technical difficulties. The internet, podcasts, microphones, all that jazz. They're a little more difficult to deal with than we'd like to imagine sometimes. So yeah, things happen. But if that ain't jazz, I don't know what is. And while Sky gets his shit together. We'll return shortly to the woodshed. Thank you for your patience. We've revived Sky. We Did have you threaten to Sky. ban me from the group? <laughs> I was trying to get your attention. I, I'm sorry. I was facing away. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh. Hey about okay. that. My mic. Well, I think my mic died. Okay. Okay. Uh. Shit. Uh, all right. Well, let's get let's get right back into it, shall we? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Just just keep going. Just keep going. <laughs> Nothing's happening. It's okay. We can keep going. This is fun. Everything. We is we fun. totally we totally didn't just have a guest die for about twenty minutes and then just revive him right now. No, that didn't happen. It's fine. We'll we'll just keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Okay. All right. What were we talking about? We're talking about Neo Soul. Does well, anybody I have think... anything else they want to say about Neo Soul? Well, um, so one of our listeners <laughs> mentioned, uh, should we, uh, is it a gateway for like kids into jazz? And I think this falls under the same argument is like smooth jazz also, uh, you know, a good gateway for people to get in the jazz. The, I don't really think it has to be kids or whatnot, but, uh, these kind of lower, you know, more calming, uh, genres i you know would you guys agree neo soul's more calming I mean, um i would yeah, agree I, that it's like less low do you know how we were talking about like free jazz um and how you eventually build up to free jazz 
you know, you listen to more and more out there stuff and you need more stuff to, you could, like, scratch that itch. I think New Soul is, like, the other end of the spectrum where, you know, there's not too much crazy stuff going on. Like, there's not too much Discord and, like, four horn lines playing different things. Um, so if, if I didn't know about jazz and, like, I heard it in a coffee shop, I probably would go back and be like, oh, who's this guy? What is jazz? I think it, I mean, Neo Soul was it, was like the gateway for me just because I was like a big D'Angelo fan. And then I later started getting into jazz because, you know, D'Angelo likes using a lot of those very complex changes and I want to listen to more stuff with that kind of harmony. Mm. I don't know. I always felt that this jazz was way too, like, um, calming for me. I got into jazz, I started with bebop. Um, <laughs> mostly like Dizzy, <laughs> like a man, Dizzy Gillespie. That, well, no, no. Uh, the man is uh, Albano, the madman who was with us uh, last time. He fucking started on free jazz, and I was just bewildered. It's that's insane. But um, yeah, I started on bebop. It was Dizzy Gillespie, so it had a little more groove. Um, and then I went to jazz fusion. But I feel like, I don't know. When I was uh, in high school, when I got into jazz, hip hop wasn't that, you know, present. Rap wasn't like what every single person in my school was listening to. They were still listening to rock and uh, electronic and stuff. So jazz fusion was the like kind of gateway drug for me before I started taking heroin, the heroin that is avant-garde. <laughs> no, it's, it's more like, what is, what is, what is avant-garde like? Because meth would be free jazz. Avant-garde is not heroin. Avant-garde, um, see, okay, I don't know how Avant-garde to... is like uh, Adderall, Adderall, that's what it is. I can see that. I mean, but there's like, there's chill avant-garde music, though. Avant-garde jazz music. Like, that's like true. Eric Dolphy, you know, who I have a huge crush on. I feel like in, I, on, free jazz? on, on average, free jazz is a little less chill, though. Yeah, I mean, I guess I it know. depends on what you define as, like, free jazz because like there's free improvisation stuff but that's not really free jazz well i mean that's kind of a question though because like if something like anthony braxton's album for alto is like the quintessential saxophone free improv album right but i still kind of call it free jazz sometimes i consider it kind of an intersection of the genres because if you listen to what he's playing especially on like the third track of that album the one uh dedicated to cecil taylor um he's got some serious like blues scale licks going on you know like he's it's not atonal and he's clearly he's clearly got some a lot of jazz framework and jazz vocabulary going on which is why i would still call it free jazz but then if you look at something like the actual pianist cecil taylor's free improv stuff um there's there's no there's not really a connection there other than cecil taylor has played jazz in the past you know like what about something like you know, Keith Jarrett's Colin concert, that's, like, completely improvised. But you'd never hear someone say, yeah, that Keith Jarrett album is free jazz. Well, yeah, that's, that's kind of what I'm saying, you know? Because, like, there's not really a, a framework there that connects it to jazz mm. at all, in my opinion. I listened to it when you sent it. And, yeah, I mean, I really liked it. But um, I, don't, I wouldn't call it free jazz. I think free jazz, you, free jazz kind of... I mean, Free Jazz goes back, of course, to the Ornette Coleman album, Free Jazz, um, which is a completely improvised album. But um, again, they're incorporating traditional jazz instrumentation, traditional jazz lines and harmony. And like, it's, it's clearly rooted deeply in jazz, you know? Yeah. Um, so that's kind of where I feel like the line has to be drawn between free jazz and free improvisation. Um, you know, if like a group that so, I like is the, oh, go ahead. Uh, so I was just going to say, let's, let's define free jazz for all the listeners. So free jazz is when you, uh, take an alto sax and just shriek on it for a constant 12 minutes and call that your improv. And you say you're very, uh, intellectual and you're freeing yourself from the form and all these restrictions. So you really put the soul out there. But if your soul is just a constant shrieking like many of the millennials today, um, I'd rather not be reminded of my constant mental state. I, anyway, I'm, a, I'm uh, about to click leave call right now. I'm about to hang up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. More, more real talk. Um, yeah, so free... 
I'm not really sure about the difference between free jazz and free improvisation. Um, but I will say, for me, free jazz, it does, I do feel like there is an abundance of shrieking on every instrument. But uh, I personally don't like free jazz because, you know, I kind of look at avant-garde and free jazz as going in the same direction. They are both experimental. They want to, you know, really push their limits and everything. Uh, avant-garde does it by having form and ideas, but the form, like the rhythm, the chord changes, all of that, becomes increasingly complex. While free jazz goes the opposite direction, uh, in increasing complexity, but they do it by getting rid of all the rules. So basically, instead of saying, oh, we're going to have a fucking song in 33-8, which is compounded with a 7-8 bar every single th three measures, and then the Fibonacci sequence is makes up every single beat, um, free jazz kind of just does the opposite and says there's there is nothing. We're just gonna we're gonna go and we're gonna make music. And a lot of the time, the reason I don't like free jazz is it feels like I walk into a middle school practice room or a middle school band room while they're all warming up, and there's just no coherency, and they're all practicing, and because they're all practicing at the same time, they uh. They can't, they, they can't hear themselves, so they keep playing louder and louder until you get a, a fucking three million decibel cacophony of noises. And that's, that is my, a lot of my take on free jazz. So Sam, yeah. do you, do you want to I mean, throw I, like, it down? Yeah, well, I'm willing to throw it down with you. Like, I'll pull up, but that's not. So like, so like um, my thing about free jazz is that you, so basically free jazz isn't really formless in my opinion you know like a lot of free jazz does have structure it's that the structure is generally a lot more abstracted if that kind of makes sense you know like i really like peter bratzman and machine gun his album is like it's my favorite album of all time i love that album and the first song on your first listen generally just kind of sounds like like exactly what you described it's like a middle school practice room nobody knows how to play their instruments everybody's yelling people are throwing shit across the room and like hitting drum breaking they're drums putting with things drumsticks. in their mouths yeah they're putting things in their mouths that aren't even instruments and that they're, they're are, trying to make do, it not supposed to go into your mouth yeah um yeah. people who have never played string instruments before have grabbed a bow and are playing with the wrong side of the bow and like yeah they're playing their trumpet with a bow yeah 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 but, do you but think like, that it, chaos is like integral to what free jazz is well, I feel like Machine Gun is kind of an extreme end of free jazz, you know, but even in that extreme end, Machine Gun, the song, still has a form, you know, it's, and there are actually still isolated solos and soloists in the song, even though it sounds kind of like chaos, like free jazz isn't, 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 its goal is not to create cacophony, it's just kind of to remove some of the limits that, that jazz had at the time. You know, like Ornette Coleman's album, uh, The Shape of Jazz to Come, of course, has to be discussed in this in this discussion, um, because why would the... it be? I see no relation to our group at all. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, there's nothing no, in common. There's no way our group is named after that. The ship posting of jazz to come. Mm -hmm. There's the like now. Yeah, we met yeah. our quota. Oh, my God. Go I'm in pain. Um, so so <laughs> the thing too. the thing that was kind of experimental about that album, mostly was that there was no piano, you know? And people kind of felt that that traditional harmony and, like, two five ones and all that stuff, the piano itself, even, was hindering the, the way people could improvise, you know? So they just got rid of it. You just have, you know, a bass and the saxophone or the soloist or whatever, and that, you know, it's in the, in the immortal words of Adam Neely, who was probably quoting somebody else, any melody note can go with any any bass note, you know? Like, there isn't a limit there, and that's kind of what the point of free jazz was, or is, to, f to like, free up your capabilities as a soloist and as an improviser. And so I don't think that, like, when you go into middle school practice room, everybody's playing random notes, but when you listen to somebody improvise 
free jazz whatever you know like like uh and like albert eiler's uh spiritual unity i think that when you listen to it on first listen it can definitely sound cacophonous but when you listen to it a couple more times you can hear that like he is creating lines you know he is creating licks but the thing is he's he's not working within a set harmonic framework if that kind of makes sense and of course he's doing the whole skronk thing but I think that's kind of like the thing that differentiates like good free jazz from like a middle school practice group is like can they do that consistently and get you like similar sounding albums, um, or you mm-hmm. know progressive albums? Because uh, I remember there was this one point where I was going through like jazz drummers and I was watching it with a friend who did the like percussion in high school, um, like classic the train whatever, and every jazz drummer we watched she would like criticize their technique. They, you know, why are, like, all jam- jazz drummers so sloppy? Because um, there was, like, one guy that was hitting, like, the snare off-center. Mm-hmm. And then he was joking about, like, what if he's consistently hitting it off-center? And he wants that slop. It's part of his quote-unquote sound. Um, and that's when we started joking about, like, if it's only a mistake if you do it once and it's inconsistent. But if it's intentionally a mistake, that's just your taste or your skill or whatever. It's just jazz. Yeah. <laughs> it's just jazz. Um... So, like, once is a mistake, like, 80 times is jazz would kind of apply to, like, free jazz, where, you know, if you put the same group of people, they put out, like, similar <laughs> albums. But middle school kids will always just sound like the beginning of a free jazz song and never get anywhere. Yeah, I mean, I, I compare free jazz to, like, modern art a lot. Um, because, like, you know, it's kind of like going into an art museum, <laughs> you see those paintings, you know, that are just somebody painted a canvas all blue or something like that. Or somebody painted the wall black, and that's the art piece, you know? And people will be like, it's, oh... I don't think that's a very fair judgment to make on, on all the free jazz. I think, yeah, some of it does tend to be very monochrome. Well, I mean, that's not really... The, but the point I was making is more that somebody would go up to that piece of art. Or something like uh, something like somebody nailed some boards together or something like that. You know, somebody would go in and say, oh, I could do that. Like, that doesn't look very hard to do. Or... It looks like they just threw paint on a canvas randomly, you know? Right, What's like this? Jackson this is Pollock or something. But the, 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 the key thing there is that anybody could have done it, but they were the ones who did do it, you know? Like, kind of anybody can pick up a saxophone and scream into it. And of course, there's a lot of techniques there and stuff like that. But it wasn't that, it wasn't that it's, it's that, that technically challenging or that, like... This okay. This is I'm I'm starting to contradict myself now because I think it is pretty technically challenging, but like what I'm saying is, it's it's the creativity to have the audacity to do that in the first place is what makes it art to me. You know, if that makes sense. Well, a lot of people say free jazz is like super easy because you just you have you don't have to concentrate that much, and you can just show off all the cool skills and everything you learned. Honestly, in my opinion, I don't think free jazz is easy because it's hard for it not to sound like shit. That's my hot take. Fuck all of you. <laughs> so did, did you guys read about like the random like MoMA things where, you know, people would go and place a pineapple on the floor and return and, you know, people are taking pictures of like fallen wallets and glasses and pineapples and they're like, wow, this high level art, like it, it speaks to me or whatever. Um, I, mm-hmm. I feel like that's where, you know, they quote unquote had the audacity to go out and do it. And um, the, it was, like, contextually in a place where you would think of it as art. And so people, you know, either thought it was art that they weren't getting, but it was still art or whatever. They labeled it as art. Um, and I think that's, like, just picking up a saxophone and shrieking into it. But I think, like, good free jazz would be, like, someone like Jackson Pollock, where they, like, train themselves to not have repetitive motion. And it looks like random, like, splats of paint, but... He, he tried really hard not to make it very repetitive, boring splats of paint. Um, and that I, took, I like, much technical that. skill. What's that? I like Pollock a lot, actually, and I think there's a great sense of movement. And you'll find that same kind of... within the cacophonous masks of free jazz if if you're listening in the right way, quote-unquote. Right. I remember yeah, some line jazz. notes to, like, kind of blue spoke about, like, this Japanese art where if you, like, hesitate... The ink splats are blocked, so you have to keep your hand moving, and you cannot hesitate. Um, and Bill Evans really like liked that art, and I, I guess that's what I was kind of trying to go for. Where it's not just like randomly moving your hand constantly; it's something you have to work towards. Yeah, I agree. 
I think the best free jazz for me, it has a very strong sense of uh, going down to the difference and just free improv from the blues. And um, when I think of something like, sorry, Sam, uh, Peter Brodsman's Machine Gun is an album, but I just don't get any sense of uniqueness at all. It doesn't do anything for me. Mm -hmm. It's just very loud. It's quiet for a few seconds, then it's loud again. The great sense of uh, originating um, uh, some distinct kind of cultural heritage. It's all just very... Um, what's thinking? Yeah, it's all just very cacophonous for the sake of cacophony. I think I think Machine Gun is cacophonous for the sake of being cacophonous, um, which I don't I don't think is like like I like that about it. You know, like it's they set out clearly. They cl the people who the eight people who made that album clearly set out with the goal of making a really loud, bombastic, like like louder than any jazz album had ever been before, and I think they did it. And I really like that about it, you know? Like, they tried to... It's kind of punk rock, I guess. Yeah, you know, and Bratzman is... <laughs> Peter Bratzman, just as a person, is very, very punk rock. And fucking see, have you seen his album titles? <laughs> They're all, like, brutal as fuck. Um, like that one album just called Sex Tape, with Sex Tape 1 through 8? Yeah, Sex Tape. He has one called Balls. He has one called Nipples. Um, Good lord. He has one Sounds called like, Die uh... Like a Dog. <laughs> He's like the Blink-182 of like jazz. Sounds like Christopher albums. He's, he's like the Blink-182 of jazz. <laughs> he's like, he's like the, I need to write that yeah. one down. That's my hot take five for the day. So I think, I think Machine Gun is a very good album to, when you're we're talking about free jazz and its merits. Eight guys. Uh, though similarly, it has eight players on it. It's very different from Ornette's uh, double quartet album. Yeah. I mean, like I said, like Machine Gun has a has a form, you know. It's not actually completely improvised. You know, you have the thing at the beginning at the end. Um, you have <laughs> people do solos and then they all go <laughs> and then they go back to soloing, right? Yep. Then you have yep. the the, the double bass is an important part of all free the jazz. double bass duo solo, right? You have that. Then you have the slow build-up, um, where it's like... And then you have a few seconds of collective improvisation. Then you have, a, you have a, like an actual like melody at the end, which I think, it's like, it goes so fucking hard at the end of that song. It's like... And it makes you want to like fucking punch something, you know? It feels like you've just been through hell. Space and you've made is it... the place. <laughs> and they... Space, is... <laughs> Space is the place is a great album. Space is the place is a great album. <laughs> Space is the place reminds me a lot of um She's science in fiction my head. by Ornette. Sunra as a whole just has so much good stuff. He was such sun, an interesting sun. character. Good old sun, sun. Like, have you heard his one album, Nuclear War? It's kind of meme-y, but it's so good. <laughs> um, I heard I've heard like the title track from that, with the one where the guys go like Nuclear war. That yeah. one. <laughs> well, I really <laughs> nuclear war. It's a nuclear war. Don't you know? Yeah. And then all the other, most of the other tracks on that are just his versions of like jazz standards. And it's so good. Yeah. Like you, like you. I like that kind of stuff. Like June Tyson's vocal performances on that album are incredible. There's a, there's a, have you guys heard of the Lounge Lizards? No. No? Okay. Well, they're a, they're a, they're a band from New York in the 70s that was, they were kind of part of like the no wave scene, if you know anything about that. Um, the guitarist from DNA is in the band, but they, they basically did like, like satirical jazz. Um, and they have a version of Epistrophe that I think is, is really cool where they basically, made it super super slow and like excruciating to listen to oh basically <laughs> it's really cool you should check it out there's this one i don't know if this is free jazz or pre improvisation but i was listening to it earlier today so i as well give it a mention there's this one bassist michael manring who he does a lot of weird stuff he was in like basically like kind of like heavier frank zappa kind of fusion band 
and then moved to just doing like solo fretless bass stuff. And like mm-hmm. he just dropped an album where it's free improvisation with his like two Hungarian musicians and this weird mix of like jazz and like traditional Hungarian folk music and it's totally improvised and it's just ridiculous. That sounds super cool. So real quick, I was wondering what you guys thought of um H. John Benjamin's jazz daredevil. And how many times <laughs> you've listened to it throughout? I think I think I've listened to the whole thing down like two or three times. I've yeah. never I couldn't listen to the whole is thing. That, is that the album is that the album where the guy doesn't know how to play piano? The guy, yes, the the guy does not play piano. <laughs> He's the that's, voice of that's Archer. That's posted to the group every single week. Pretty much, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I thought it was funny. I would like to do an experiment where, you know, you have someone that's never listened to jazz, and then they try to play jazz like that, and then you have someone who listens to like jazz for like a month, then attempts the album. I'd I'd like to see some right. of these different. There were like outcomes. brief segments in the album where I was like, "Yo, that was actually a really good line," and then it goes back to like, I think that that was like the thing. It never resolved. It never went anywhere. But he had some pretty nice quote unquote lines, which is kind of sad. Which kind of tells me how bad jazz is. <laughs> oh, it speaks jazz. volumes to the shittiness of jazz as a genre. Have you guys heard? There's this one, like, Jaco Pastor's Pat Metheny album where it's basically free jazz. Pat really Metheny, good. Pat Metheny, okay. Fuck Pat Metheny is my first thing to <laughs> say to that. Why? Second that? of all. <laughs> Isn't it Pat Metheny? Isn't it Metheny? I thought it was No, Metheny. it's not. It's not Metheny. What the fuck are you talking about? He has an A. <laughs> Sam, I think Sam, it might be Andy like, Kappa so It does not have an A in it. No, it's an E. It's like meth. Oh, it's a... yeah. Pat Metheny. Oh, that makes a lot more sense now. Um, okay. Pat Metheny has an album with, um, uh, Ornette Coleman called Song X. It's a it's a free jazz album. It's the only recording I've ever liked Pat Metheny on. That's that a is good it. album. It is a it is a very good album, and everything else I've ever heard Pat Metheny on, he is shit. Bright size life. There though. you go. No, fuck that album. Pat, Pat Metheny ruins the album. That's such a good album. Why do you hate Pat Metheny? <laughs> because Pat Metheny's guitar tone is, like, fucking terrible. Oh, okay. I, can I s- do like what he said about Kenny G, though. I can see some... I mean, I like his tone, but I can see why people wouldn't like it. Because it's very distinctive. Yeah. It is very distinctive. He plays a lot with, like, on Song X with, like, weird things where he turns his guitar tone to like into like a synth saxophone tone it's really weird i liked it a lot um although ornette of course is the star of the album because how could ornette not be the star of the album i mean like it's weird because like people i always thought of like Matheny before i got into him as just that like weather channel on the eights guy <laughs> <laughs> like that's literally how i th- like i dismissed pat Matheny because i like was like oh yeah isn't he the weather channel on the eights person and then i like started getting into his stuff and i was like oh when he's not Wither Channel on the 8s, he's really good. Pat Metheny, there's that one picture of Pat Metheny I kind of like where it looks like he's taking a picture and like middle school picture day. He's got his guitar. It's like a really cute picture, actually. <laughs> That's such a wholesome picture. Of this other weird guitar album, because I interviewed this guy who's like, he's like a 36 string double neck guitar and he makes free jazz because of course he does. Oh, you know he's good. <laughs> So he just more strings yeah. it means better. So listens to Dream Theater once. And he did an album with a trumpet player. That Dude, was that, pretty the good. bassist has like six jazz. strings. It's fucking crazy. Six. Doesn't my bass Thundercat has four strings? String he thing? has two. He has two more strings than me. He has two more. That's like I don't even have. You only have four <laughs> fingers to play with. He has percent more you strings have, than me. You need like you need like seven fingers, you know, because you know you don't play. I mean, I guess you can play with your thumb, but it's like you know six strings. I don't have I don't have six fingers. I don't know how you do it. It's crazy. Yeah. Well, I'm, Thundercat plays a six string bass, right? I love Thundercat. Yeah, he plays a six string bass. It's funny though. People on like bass, like bass forums, will always complain like, "Oh, Jacko didn't need four six strings." 
people on like base that. forms roast Jacko? Yeah, because they're like, no, like they're roast people like Thundercat because they'll be like, oh, Jacko didn't need two oh, more strings okay. to be good. <laughs> yeah, they'll all Stop. say, four is enough. If you can't make music with only four strings, you're a fuck. I mean, you're it's a, like, you're a fuck. Really? I. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I feel like musicians definitely like to eat their own a bit. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, that's one way the to get Rob gigs. Sk- the people who are saying, you know, Jocko only Jocko did it with four. I mean, with that kind of reasoning, basically you should uh be like Rob Scallion and play the fucking shovel, the one string shovel bass. Or whatever. <laughs> uh, I mean, you you can't just say you it's that argument doesn't work. Rob Scallion, I don't really like that that kind of corner of the of internet YouTube jazz or internet jazz or like YouTube music thing. You know, like Rob Scallion and Andrew Huang and like that guy with the long hair with the long red hair. Um, I don't like them like at all. <laughs> I don't think they're they don't they don't really they don't do anything for me. I'm kind of with you I don't on know. that. Especially Andrew Huang, I I don't I don't vibe with him at all. <laughs> you don't like hacking jazz? Hacking that video literally <laughs> it made me want to rip my eyes out. Like it made me want to never watch a YouTube video again. Yeah, he was I like, think that's he like starts the off the video, like the he infomercials the video, he's at like, four AM TV, where you're like, huh, I'm bored. Let me watch this guy play like a fifty-two string bass or whatever that one guy keeps playing. Where they're like, huh, that's impressive, but can you play, you know, behind your back, whatever. Um, I don't think that's for, like, serious consumption. I, I have a soft spot for, like, double neck guitar, though, because um, uh, John McLaughlin played one. So, I like that. That's great. Oh, that's true. Okay. Hey, since, since we were just on the subject of bass, uh, can we name drop our favorite jazz bassists? Ooh. Bass. Scott LaFaro <laughs> has to be up there. I like Dave Holland a lot. Dave yeah, Holland, Ron Carter, Jacob Astoris. The the second basis for Evans <laughs> that I'm completely blanking out on. Uh, uh who else? Jimmy Garrison. Yeah. He's probably my number <laughs> Just, one. Justin Chancellor, favorite favorite jazz bassist. Ever. There'll there'll be there'll be some people who know I'm talking Eddie about. Eddie Gomez, there we go. That's oh, yeah. his name. Eddie Gomez. Was I great. really liked his uh, solos. Like Johnny Diani a lot. He was a South African player. Raheem. Does somebody say Richard Davis already? Because I have never listened to anything he did on his own, but he played on Out to Lunch. So. I mean Charlie Hayden. <laughs> um. We're all forgetting one big one. Uh, there's uh, Adam, uh, Clayton. Adam Clayton. Adam Clayton's a good one. Yeah, I mean, I mentioned... yeah, I'm pretty sure he played bass at one point. I mentioned Michael Manring earlier. I gotta give him another shout out. Michael Manring. Yeah, that you have, okay, everybody who mentioned an album in this in this episode has to put a link to it somewhere so I can listen to them. Oh yeah, I'll put it in the description when this is released as a video, if it ever is. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave anime. a comment on this video and check the description. Smash that like button. Don't don't forget. Smash that like button if you want to smash the jazz. Uh, yeah, I'll put it in the video. Um, trying to get those videos released, but uh, apparently in a group of uh, over 6,500 people, not a single person can give me a smoke animation or an audio visualizer. So, uh, <laughs> you should hit up like the, the 2011 like, me. I made... YouTube makers. Do, do you ever see those? Where, I like... made a smoke oh, animation. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, there's a guy that offered me to do that. Yeah, because we have, well, I'll talk about it later, but um, just so we don't bore the listeners more than we already are with jazz. But I mean, I, ma- I made three. Three fucking posts, like, cr- begging for someone to lead me in this hunt. And no one, they, they just, no one they, they're all fucking weebs. We they, should they do it with, like, stealth motion. Oh, a, a, a group of 6,499 60, 60, 60, 60, people and Andy. The, and the 6,000 yeah, exactly. are all weebs. I'm surrounded by weebs. They're all weebs. They're all <laughs> weebs. 
There are too many damn weebs in this music group. Go check out that group. It's good. Weeb, weeb Purge 2018. Do you think jazz attracts weebs? Destroy Is there all something Chinese about jazz? cartoons. Andy. Did you say there's something about anime that links to jazz? What's the deal? Yeah. <laughs> well, why are there so many in weebs in this group? That and, and Super Smash Bros. Melee plays. There's way too many in a jazz group. Honestly, jazz was dead until Cowboy Bebop dropped their first album. That is true. Oh my god, I love that band. Okay, well. <laughs> half, the music's not, half the music's not even Bebop. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Cowboy Bebop doesn't like, even play like Bebop. What the it's fuck? It's like calling yourself It's like calling yourself the the Andy Brent Neo Soul Quartet and then you just fucking shriek on your horns. Right. We it's should, like we not as bad that. as that saying good. your we favorite jazz, jazz album is Kenny G. <laughs> Can we record really a low jazz quality album from this? <laughs> Can the next podcast just be everyone recording a jazz album? The Discord jam. I, I that mean, I sounds have, like I have my trumpet right here. I mean, it, I mean, it was already hard enough to get us to just talk on Discord. <laughs> I think oh the mics God. cut out because they knew what was coming. They were like, "Oh shit, they're gonna play jazz now." Let me disconnect Skyro Skylar real quick. It's yeah, the, rip, it's rip the Skylar. government. Skylar, are you with okay. us, buddy? <laughs> I think he's still dead. <laughs> I think he's still Wait, dead. Did he die again? <laughs> he's not here. I'm still here. He's still here. Right, oh okay. my god, he's still with us. Praise, praise the Lord. Hot takes. Hot I takes. My favorite bassists. I think I've done all I can here. So what hot so takes? Right. Uh, does well, anyone have hot takes for us? As, as we start to wrap takes. up. Okay, let me, let me fucking tell no, you. As my, all as of you guys. Here's my hot take. Check out. What did you shut the fuck up while I'm talking? Everyone has <laughs> the same time. I do like jazz. <laughs> I, gosh, so I'm not a fucking bass solo. You don't have to back. interrupt me. Let me tell you, I am a trumpet player. I play higher and louder than everyone else. I am the best. You can all suck it. Anyway, so all of you need to check out Don Ellis. He is an amazing man. His Twitter is Don Ellis at twitter.com. Jazz. Fantastic well, guy. Don Please Ellis join the John Ellis. Please join the Don Ellis fan club on Facebook. I post stuff. Don Ellis you... is my favorite. He is my inspiration. He is my love. He is my life. I wake okay. up every morning and I think about him relentlessly. Do not cut me off! I'm not done ranting. Just, so Don Ellis, ask you to add me to the let group. me tell I'm you sorry. about this Donnie boy. Let me tell you about this Donnie boy. So Donnie, he went to India and he he listened and he listened and he came up. He's like, you know what? American rhythms? Nah. 4-4? Four, four, nah. 3-4? Nah. 7-8? Nah. 11-8? Nah. We got to go three and two thirds four time. We got to go 33 eight. We got to go. We have to go hard. We're going to use minor seconds and quarter tones for the entire fucking song so that we alienate our audience. Let me tell you one thing. Don Ellis is one of the best jazz musicians that has graced this earth. And you should all be lucky that you have a chance to listen to him. Don Ellis is the future of jazz to come. Thank you. I just want to say Don Ellis has written songs in seven. So. That's it. That's all I have to say. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm fully aware. I'm fully aware. <laughs> no, Don Ellis is great. I, I listened to a bunch of the stuff that you sent me, Andy. Um, so I've I've expanded my Don Ellis knowledge now beyond Electric Bath and Soaring. Although I still think Electric Bath yes. is his best album. Check out uh, Live at the Fillmore is probably his best album. So if anyone Live at the has Fillmore. never started with him, the Fillmore is in San Francisco, which is where I live. Fillmore. Fantastic. Any, anyone else want to rant about a musician? I'll say. Uh, I'll... Oh, no, you go ahead, Sam. You go ahead. Oh, uh, please. Please, Sky. You've been muted for most of this time. <laughs> <laughs> I might as well. Well,. Say free jazz is great, and by all means, you should totally live jazz as well. Jazz is just great in general. But let me just name drop Ornette Coleman, John Coltrane, and Don Pullen. Those are my free jazz heroes, and they should be yours too. E. Um. So I uh, I don't know I don't I don't know about you guys, but it it cut out on every single important <laughs> part. And I, wasn't I heard sure Ornette he Coleman and John Coltrane. So there you go. Okay, Ornette, Ornette Coleman. 
and don't pull in. Got it. All right. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'm a big fan of uh, my, my top three favorite, favorite jazz musicians are, are probably Peter Bratzman and Eric Dolphy and uh, Rasan Roland Kirk. Oh, um, Rasan Roland Kirk. Oh. Oh. Rasan Roland Kirk is fucking awesome. I love Rasan Roland Kirk. He's so <laughs> he good. has the only flute solo I've ever enjoyed. I maintain that you've okay, but Eric Dolphy also played flute, so I'm gonna send you a song where Eric Dolphy has a cool flute solo. Um, but you just need to you just need to listen to Out to Lunch, Andy. You really do. But um, I have, I have. You listened to Out to Lunch. and You didn't like Gazzaloni. The third song, I, I Eric Dolphy plays that flute album. on that it song. It was so forgettable. Wow. I'll wow. Listen I'll listen to it wow. again. I'll much. listen to it again. <laughs> it's great. That it, you really cut deep with that one. Uh, you I, should listen to Iron Man though. My, if you didn't like my it. opinions, cut deep into everyone. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, those are those are my three favorites. Um, especially Eric Dolphy and Peter Brotsman. They're 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 big guys. They're big people. <laughs> Whatever that means. <laughs> uh, Peter's okay. Yeah. I understand. Peter's a divisive guy. Um, I, I have listened to like literally 30 Peter Brotsman albums um, with different collaborators and stuff. And yeah, he's a. Uh, I, I am. I am obsessed. <laughs> I just want to say my favorite jazz musician is uh, Andy Brent, especially. Making me admin for the group. I think that's Every let's all clap for Andy, everybody. No, I'm kidding. I think my inexperience shows in how boring my favorite jazz musicians are, because it's literally just you know Bill Evans and Coltrane and Mingus. It's no one too out there, no one crazy. Coltrane and Mingus no, were out there though. If you. Interstellar yeah, I mean, and, and Kenny G. Well, I, I, I lied. It's actually just <laughs> Kenny G and H. John Benjamin. Shout out to Kenny G. Andy, what were you saying? Yeah, the worst you could say, the worst you could say is like, oh, my, I love jazz. My favorite artist uh, got to be Louis Armstrong, Kenny G, Louis, Ar Louis Armstrong, and wait, Louis Armstrong, yeah, Louis Armstrong. Louis Louis. <laughs> let it be known Both. that it, let it be known that Andy Brent believes that you pronounce Louis Armstrong's name Louis Armstrong. Okay, so we have Cecil Taylor. No, 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 no. No, <laughs> I don't. I know. I know his name is Louis Armstrong, but if I say if I say Louis Armstrong, all the fucking normies in the group are like, oh, that's not how you say his name. Haven't you ever heard him before? No, it's pronounced Louis Armstrong. That's how he said his own name. But so, if I say oh, Louis, people are like, oh, you're fucking, you're fucking stupid. stupid. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I am fully... Aware. But Raga, but Raga, Bill Evans anyway. is like one of the goats. Like that's nothing to be. Right. Bill Evans is good. I, I think it was like, um, I think Sam, you posted this. It was like hot take. Bill Evans voicing they use every day now in the super boring. I know. Uh, I did not post that, but I someone, did see someone that. Someone posted. Oh that. no, no, that was. It was. I'm sitting in my physics classroom, and it. I I fell asleep. Or it put me to sleep, just like all of Bill Evans' discography. Bad take. Yeah, you need to <laughs> justify that, 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 buddy. That you, you have five minutes. This is your hot take five. Bill Evans oh, that's is not, not boring. Me. That's, go. I, I did not post that. I did not say that. I, I did not use that. that no, that Evans. was... I don't remember who that is. Let me clarify one thing, though. Yeah. I did say, if you say, Miles... If you say, I love jazz, Miles Davis is my favorite. That's only, like, if you've... If you love Miles Davis, but only have listened to Kind of Blue and Bitches Brew. You right. can't say I love Miles Davis without listening to all of it. So that's I just wanted to clarify. Even that. Bitches yeah. Brew is like Andy out there Brent. enough to warrant like some interest. Like Bitches Brew isn't everyone's like first jazz album. I wouldn't say Andy, it's everyone's Andy first. Andy Brent, the Bitches god of jazz, Brew has declared. Out there. <laughs> it, it, it's definitely out there. Like if someone said I like Miles Davis, Bitches Brew, I I, I just stop talking to them because a you know something's <laughs> fundamentally wrong with. Them. I think Herbie. Okay, Hill. you want to hear my hot take? You hot, hear take, my hot take. I I hate Bitches Brew. Oh, right, here's my hot take, right? Bitches Brew, I think Bitches Brew is like one of Miles' worst fusion albums. I think that yes, in a silent way, in a silent way, in a silent way Agartha, Live Evil, um, yeah. Ooh, on the, Jack Johnson, Jack and Johnson. On the Corner, but only the complete sessions of those. Um, yeah. Up with it. And Get Up With It, especially Get Up With It. 
I think those are all like way better than Bitches I mean, Brew. You know but Bitches way. Brew kind of gets you the. Take away, if you take away the historical importance and like the shift into new genres, you know, it paved the way for stuff. Bitches Brew is just kind of shitty, especially Miles' input on it. Because that's when he, I believe that's when his tone started to die. And he started using a Harmon mute like 24 7 or just screeching. It's really strange. He all of a sudden started like screeching, just doing like short bursts of high notes, and he never used to do that. It's really I don't, you wouldn't expect it. I don't hate that about him actually. <laughs> so, um, I still like bitches brew, but uh, I st- uh, I feel like in a silent way is much better. Yeah, I think in a silent way is more influential. Honestly, in a silent way was like was like the first big fusion album. And it was like the first ambient album, even you know, like it, revol- it like made that genre a thing. So I don't know. Uh, quick, that. quick shout out now that Andy crazy. got his Don Ellis runt in. You guys should check out the interviews with uh, Tio Macero, who is the um, Columbia editor for you know Bitches Brew. Actually, pretty much everything from Kind of Blue to Bitches Brew. Um, he was the guy putting the tapes together. And apparently he was, like, a huge influence with uh, the final, like, Bitches Brew album. So apparently they just handed, like, nine hours of complete sessions, and they were like, yo, fix this. And then Tio, who I think had a position <laughs> background, um, he said he took, like, 40 stacks of tapes and then mixed them down into two. And he would kind of, like, listen to something an hour in and be like, hey, this makes a logical step in from what I listened to five, like, in the first five minutes. And he, like, spliced the whole thing together so yeah. um it's, it's pretty much like he yeah. made the final album from like the pile of shit that was like nine hours of straight up like jamming so um but some some people criticize it because you can hear like loop points i think in the first three minutes like he he segments like a 12 second section like two or three times you can hear like the, the jump when it like starts back at the beginning of the loop but um yeah these interviews where he like impersonates miles is so funny. Where apparently one day, <laughs> oh yeah, Miles, I've seen some of them. Yeah. Yeah, Miles's manager calls up and he's like, "Now nah, listen, here, you white motherfucker, I ain't gonna do that kick." And it's just you know, <laughs> <laughs> that, okay, that yeah, was perfect. I, lo- I love that. No, yeah, yeah, he actually goes on and like impersonates Miles for business calls. It's so funny. <laughs> I, I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> and he always says uh, that, yeah. Listen here, you white motherfucker. He always <laughs> uses the white motherfucker. Well, That's because that right. Miles Davis it. just said the word motherfucker like all the time. <laughs> well, you, but you gotta have white motherfucker. So, do you guys oh, remember the last song from In a Silent Way? Um, I, I don't remember the name. Uh, but it, it, I think the last minute it, In a Silent Miles Way slash, going, uh, It's about that time. Is yeah, yeah. Is that the one where it just ends with yeah, yeah. Dio? Play that. Play that. Dio, Dio, have you guys heard that? Dude, I don't really <laughs> no. know. I don't no, I have know. not heard that. <laughs> okay, well, go listen to uh, the, the, the Spotify I think you're thinking of, of something, maybe way. from the Complete Sessions or something. No, 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 this is the very last song on the actual album. I'm pretty sure that's not in there, dude. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know what I you're talking about. I've listened to this album many times. I, I just want an hour... I just want an hour of Miles whispering expletives into my ear. That would be yeah, great. You, you guys have heard Someone of like the ASMR that. trend, where you know people just whisper for hours. We should do that. <laughs> it's just Miles, Miles Davis. <laughs> just, Miles just, Davis just, ASMR, very just, soothing. Yeah. It's just him saying, "Why am I listening to you, white motherfucker?" As <laughs> <laughs> trumpeter, and why is his name Miles Davis? Oh my god, What'd here you we say? go. You're gonna make Andy start ranting about Don Ellis again. <laughs> what did you say about him? I said, Miles just happens to be the greatest jazz trumpeter, isn't that funny? I'm about to explode. <laughs> oh my god. That was a very charged silence right there. <laughs> right. I will, so I will wanna... say, actually... The... No, go ahead, Andy. I will say, sorry. Um, I will say Don Ellis isn't the best trumpet player. But he is a phenomenal musician, and he has made a lot of important, well, I mean, he hasn't, he's influenced me, but uh, he has a lot of trumpet playing style that's not really present in a lot of other people's playing. Um, 
but yeah, his tone is kind of uh, it's a different one. It feels uh, more like he wants to fly all the time. It's mm-hmm. not very uh, grounded. Uh, Would yeah. you in I terms of best trumpet player? I'd say Clifford Brown, Lee Morgan, and Lester Bowie for all the weird sounds he can make. Um. So on on rate your music. Don El- almost all of Don Ellis's albums are classified as experimental big band. Would you agree with that classification? Because I'm not sure if I would call it experimental per se. Oh no, I would definitely say it's experimental. It's just he uh, controls it a lot more. I mean, Don Ellis had a album or at least a song, a tune where he had two orchestras, like two full orchestras. The n- name of the tune's Cross Currents. Mm -hmm. um but i mean yeah he the thing with his big bands is he introduced a lot of kind of strange instruments to the normal big band setup he almost always had a string section uh he had at least three drum sets on set um plus percussion uh usually the third drum set was for himself (laughs) and uh but he's also i mean made there's there's albums that are really hard to find, and I mostly have bootlegs of uh, his small combo stuff, which is, they are insane. Uh, he's got Pieces of Eight, which is an octet album. That's the one that's going to be easiest to find. He also had the Hindustani Nanet, I think. I think the numbers changed. That's a good one. But uh, I would say it's experimental. Um, a lot of jazz fusion experimental. But he kind of, it's more controlled. He knows what he's mm-hmm. doing. It's not like full on, it's not art music. It's no, I, I, I can hear it's, it's very, it's very arranged, you know? It's he also has some intentionally tunes. arranged. He, f- he fucks with like almost every tune he does. Um, there are very little tunes you can find that are kind of played more traditional. Um, I th- he has a recording of I Remember Clifford, which is pretty normal. Um, and honestly, I don't like it that much. <laughs> but <laughs> if you're listening to Don Ellis, you can expect something weird with the song. If you want, if you want like to see someone absolutely trash a song, listen to Don Ellis's recording of Hey Jude up until you have to listen for the head past the intro. It is one of the most disgusting things I have ever heard. And people like in the comments section are like, oh, I love this. It's so great. Better than the original. I can't tell if they're <laughs> trolling or not. Because I think he intentionally made the, su- the song sound like fucking awful. Anyway, that's I another Don Ellis. Chances like, are I'm going to hear that and, and really thing, love it. I guess. So um, a note for future episodes of the podcast. Don't get Andy started talking about Don Ellis. Wait, who's Just, Don Ellis? Don Ellis. Don Ellis. Don Ellis band topic. Oh, on you don't the know who Don Ellis is. Well, no, Don, Don, Don Ellis, Ellis is like the experimental synth player for Moonchild, right? <laughs> oh my god! Well, thanks, Andy. I've got some homework now. All right. So, do you guys want to start wrapping up? I think uh, we're hitting an hour thirty. Yeah, I think we're definitely yeah. hitting time. We're at one ten. Yeah, yeah. The the Don the Don Ellis. We'll just call this the Don Ellis episode. Um, Keith, can you just cut out everything before that and just keep the Don Ellis bits? Thank you. Loop, loop that part. Anyway, Dude, this, uh, is our Tio Macero. this has loop been. That part. This is. You white this motherfucker! Is I if you don't Make loop that the fucking Don Ellis part. Of Miles Davis ASMR a reality soon. <laughs> oh gosh, I need. Yeah, we should do that. All right. Well. This has been the Don Ellis podcast. I mean, this has been the Woodshed podcast um, with Sam, Matt, Ragav, and uh, Sky. <laughs> He's been muted for so long. Oh my God. He's been muted for so long, I forgot who the fifth person was. The real name I'm of this sorry. podcast is Rip Sky. Rip Sky. Rip Sky. Uh, all right. Uh, join us next week. Next, next quick. Join us next week for uh, this podcast. I believe Sam will be returning for that one. Absolutely. Um. And yeah. Uh, ha- have a great whatever the time it is there. Faces. Faces. Yep. That's the end. Faces. 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 Faces.
I hate you. I mean, he doesn't kill my family or anything, but you know what has killed? My school.